I wish I could go back and redo everything I just said, but unfortunately, that's a waste of time. So welcome to uh, the Varietal Perspective class, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc. We're talking about Pinot Noir from really all different pl places of the planet. We're talking about Cabernet Franc, mainly from France. Um, and then we're also talking about kind of the breakdown of these wines based off of their structure. The agenda here is we want to we want to take these wines and we want to break them down in terms of their six elemental points of structure, starting with acid, starting with tannin, alcohol, sugar, uh, color and extract, and then how they smell, so aroma. Uh, and again, we'll define some of these things as we go along. And then we want to talk about the grapes. This is a varietal class. So how do these grapes perform in the vineyard? How do they perform in the winery? And what is kind of the classic uh, character of that wine across the palate. Uh, obviously, as we get to our regional differences, that character across the palate is going to change, and we want to talk about what what is that change, what makes these wines unique for that place. Then we're going to talk about noble regions for Cabernet Franc. We're going to break it down really into France, Italy, and the United States. Not as many growing areas as we'll see in Pinot Noir, and then we'll do the same thing for Pinot Noir, except kind of with a little bit more detail. We actually will break Pinot Noir down into both kind of old world categories, meaning Europe and Western Europe and really Eastern Europe. Uh, and then we will <laughs> break it down into new world regions, which includes the United States, which includes several growing areas, but primarily two, which is California and Oregon. And obviously the wine that you have is from Oregon. So we'll spend a little bit more time on Oregon Pinot than we do the other regions. But I do wanna make a few comments about those other regions, just so you have some uh, indication or insight into those wines if you were to go out and buy, let's say, a Pinot from New Zealand. Uh, and then if there is time, I, I will finish with something a little bit, a little higher level detail, which is unique to Pinot specifically, which is colonial, colonial selections or colonial selections of Pinot Noir, which is probably way beyond where we need to be. But it's interesting for Pinot because Pinot being a, a grape that's been planted for well over 2,000 years, is a grape that in and itself is prone to mutation. And so as a result of that, we have many different clones of Pinot and each clone lends it something to something different. And particularly when we get to Germany, we'll talk briefly about German Pinot. What makes German Pinot so unique considering it is uh, really a wine that has been created in the last 20 years. Uh, and I have a really famous quote from Robert Parker about German Pinot Noir uh, that will that will I'll tell you as we kind of get to that section. Okay, so you should have two glasses of wine in front of you. As I mentioned before, the Willamette Valley Pinot is actually the lighter color of the wine. You should have tasted them both. So let's go ahead and define our structure. Let's let's start with the Chinon. Chinon is the name of the village. It's 100% Cabernet Franc, 12 months in French oak, typically neutral oak. This is a wine that's all about the fruit and of the place. So give it a swirl, give it a sniff, and then let's give it a taste and talk about its structure. I do, when we get to the varietal kind of breakdown characteristics, there, I do have a, um, a pop-up that will talk about kind of classic character of the wine. But let's kind of just jump right into um, kind of just brief aromas. Well, let's start with fruits and then non-fruits. So I'm gonna list, kind of keep it simple Simon situation, two non-fruits, two fruits, and then we're gonna move on. So in terms of two fruits, uh, definitely kind of this red, black, cherry, bean, cherry situation. And it's almost, in terms of the character of that fruit, that cherry is underripe. It's a little bit more tart. And then I would say that the other type of fruit would maybe be like a pomegranate. Uh, it's a little bit seedy, it's a little bit tart, it's very fresh, okay? Two non-fruits, uh, minus oak smells or anything like that. There is this kind of very um, dusty minerality, uh, almost kind of um, chalky in a way. And then the other non-fruit would be this kind of element of a bell pepper component, little green, little herbal component. Okay, your non-fruits and your fruits can be something totally different. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. I mean, I care, but I don't care. Okay, so give it a taste. The thing that we should be paying attention to on the initial taste, 
One, we want to set the palate. That's why I'm having you taste multiple times. I want you to really forget your first taste because that's really going to always be more aggressive, more acidic than the tastes that follow. So on your second taste, what you should be paying attention to is really kind of the acid, the weight, the body, the dryness of the wine. For me, I always like to taste in three steps. I like to taste for dryness first, how dry is the wine? Then I like to taste for acids, how acidic is the wine? And then the third taste is really body and flavors, okay? So give it another taste, we're tasting for dryness. How dry is the wine is the question. And this in terms of your six elements of structure, if you're following along on the agenda, is really the question about sugar. I know I kind of am jumping down in terms of structure, but it's sometimes it's easier to taste for dryness first because it may not be, uh, well, it's a little bit more apparent than body or maybe acid levels. So the wine is dry. It's almost like, like I wouldn't say bone dry or, or extremely dry, like let's say um, uh, a Sauvignon Blanc could be or some sparkling wines or even Muscadet, uh, but it's definitely dry. It, it's, not, it's not rich, meaning it, there's not like a, 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 a robotussum texture to it that kind of coats the palate. It's a little bit linear, lean, uh, linear, not linear. I don't know if linear is a word. Uh, linear, um, but the wine is dry, okay? So we kind of can check off the sugar box in terms of structure. The wine is dry. So give it another taste. We're tasting for acid. The question about acid is how much does your palate, how much do you salivate? If you're like, like that gushery, gusher candy where you're just like developing moisture all throughout your palate, the wine is high in acid. So we will really define this as medium acid, high acid, low acid. Let's keep it simple. And it's windy today. I'm having a, a Kramer hair day. Um, so I was going to wear a hat, but then I figured that would look not as uh, charming on video. <laughs> okay. Super high in acid. Like a, a constant, like even after you swallow, you continue to develop saliva on your palate. So we're going to call that high acid. So now we have a dry, high acid. Now we need a taste for body. Let's go back to what we learned from Chardonnay and the class since Chardonnay, which was the Red Blends class. Chardonnay is always in the middle. The question is, is this wine fuller bodied than a Chardonnay? If the answer is yes, then you know that it's to the, it's to the right of medium body. We know that Chardonnay is medium body. If it's to the left of medium body, then it's lighter than medium body. This is going to kind of feed into uh, maybe in another class uh, drinking order. You want to wine, you want to drink your wine from lighter body to fuller body. This idea of white rosé red wine in terms of drinking order is is nonsense. The whole idea is you need to drink wine based off of their structure, which is why it's so important to pay attention to structure. All right, I would say that. The wine is dry. I don't think that it's quite as full bodied as my traditional California or Burgundy Chardonnay. It's verging on that level, but it's not quite there. So in reality, this wine would be kind of medium minus bodied or light medium bodied, depending on how you describe it. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of, I'm gonna go on a tangent here because this is, uh, as I was putting the notes together for this class and I really hear it all the time, which is you will hear people talk about a red wine as full bodied or light bodied or medium bodied, whatever it may be. And then you will hear in the in a next, another comment that will be this wine is, this white wine is full bodied. The reality is, is in context of what? Like when we talk about a, a white full bodied wine, is it is that term full bodied in the in the contra and the construct of a white wine the same definition of full bodied in the construct of a red wine and the reality is is if we are all speaking the same language when we say full bodied white wine in my head when you talk to me i think you think that that white wine tastes as full bodied as a cabernet reserve or a, or a barossa shiraz or an amarone 
So it's very confusing when you use the term full-bodied and white wine or light-bodied and red wine in terms of actually what they are in the world of all wines. You know, while we separate white and red, you could say this is a, a full-bodied white wine, a fuller-bodied white wine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's as full-bodied as the fullest-bodied reds can be. So uh, it, it, details are everything, uh, nuance is everything in wine, and so for me, that's always uh, one of the things that stands out when people are when I'm writing about wine or talking about wine is is really to get to the the idea of body really helps you define where that wine actually sits compared to every other wine in the world. And so, to to just be a little bit more casual about it um, lends itself to a little bit of a um, a miscommunication or a misunderstanding of actually what the wine is actually doing on your palate. So for this wine, I will say that it's slightly less body than Chardonnay, verging on medium body. It's dry uh, in terms of its, um, that was in terms of its sugar, in terms of its acid, it's high acid. So we have a medium, light to medium body, verging on medium body, dry, high acid red wine from Cabernet Franc from Chinon. And if you put that in a sentence, like you were to describe that and try to go out and sell that or talk to another wine professional, they would automatically understand exactly what you are tasting and what you're saying. They will appreciate that, that level of detail. In terms of character of, of fruit, I said kind of underripe cherry, a little bit of pomegranate. It's a little bit seedy and tart. And then in terms of the non-fruits, we have a little bit of this kind of red bell pepper, pyrazine, um, green herbal thing along with a little bit of kind of dusty minerality okay so the last thing we need to talk about we have acid we have tannin alcohol sugar we've already done that color and aroma so <clears throat> if you already finished your glass while I was talking pour yourself another one um, in terms of color if you look at this color this is the quintessential color of cherry and so when we talk about why Cabernet Sauvignon has this very d deep depth of cherry color. It's because it gets it from Cabernet Franc as its father. You know, we'll talk about the lineage of Cabernet Sauvignon, but Cabernet Sauvignon gets its color because it's one of its parent varietals is Cabernet Franc. And Cabernet Franc is the quintessential cherry. Now, so we're gonna define this as cherry, but then we have the next layer down, which is what is the concentration of cherry or what is the extract of cherry? Is it a light cherry, medium cherry, dark cherry? Is it so dark that it's opaque that I can't really see anything through the glass? Are things that we need to really define? Because when we start talking about extract or the concentration or the depth of a color, all of that is gonna lend itself to information about the youth of that wine, the aging potential of that wine, the body of that wine. Um, and so we can start to use color as a way to not only identify the type of varietal, but where it is in its maturity and its evolution as a wine as a whole, okay? So in terms of depth of color, <clears throat> at some point you're gonna have to define um, your own standard for this. And that may seem ambiguous, but in, when we teach this in, in certification courses, we really teach it based off of what you can actually see looking through the, through the wine. And so depending on how full your glass is, you may not be able to see anything. And that's the question is how full your glass is. But in reality, I would say that this wine is a medium cherry. It's not opaque. Uh, it, it's still got enough depth of color that it, it stands out in the glass as a darker wine, but it's definitely not the darkest wine. And it's not nearly as light as my Pinot Noir. So I would define my Pinot Noir as kind of a light to medium color or level of extraction. And I would define my Cabernet Franc as a, a medium level of, of extraction. I don't know if I said attraction there or extraction, uh, but if I said a, a medium or a light level of attraction, <laughs> uh, we, this just turned into a dating service. Okay, and then aroma. So give it a smell. Again, we've kind of characterized our fruits and non-fruits. You kind of get the idea of what aroma is, but let me reiterate the definition of aroma. Aroma is the smell of the fruit and the smell of the place. Okay, that's the definition of aroma. Definition of bouquet is basically everything else. That includes both the smell of production, oak barrels, malolactic fermentation, lease treatment, uh, and then it also includes the smell of age. So as this wine ages, 
it's going to develop more savory, more umami character. That age characteristic is considered also part of bouquet. Okay, so we consider aroma part of the varietal characteristics because if I'm looking to blend based off of our last class, if I have a highly aromatic varietal like we had in our Tempranillo blend, which was the Graciano or Petit Verdot and the Bordeaux blend, these are highly aromatic uh, varietals that you don't need to put a whole lot in the wine to actually get the, 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 the lift that that varietal provides. Okay. So let's go to Pinot, unless there's any questions. By the way, if you haven't been to the, here's the question. Um, I, we had to figure out where to put these videos. So I put them on YouTube. So all the videos from the previous classes are currently on YouTube. Uh, when you get to that YouTube channel, there is a brief description of that class. And then there is something that says show more. When you click on show more, it actually has the link to all the, the documentation and the images and the PDFs that I've used throughout the classes. So you can link on that and it'll show you all the information that I am referencing in the class. So this is the Vinovian Pinot. We have produced this wine now for, correct me if I'm wrong, Craig, but I think four vintages now. And it has always been kind of, for us, we always wanted a lighter bodied style of Pinot compared to other Pinots and understand my pretext there, I said lighter bodied Pinot, not a light bodied wine, because it's not as light bodied as you will find in other wines. Um, Pinot is, 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 is a total pain in the ass, both in the vineyard and in the winery, and therefore it is why it is expensive. And so to produce a wine that you could, you know, $28 and under, that is Pinot that drinks like this, um, we know that we needed a wine that was really all about the fruit. So this is uh, Willamette Valley Pinot. It's actually 98% Pinot Noir and 2% uh, of a grape called Marshal Falsch, which is a French hybrid, um, which is another red grape, but it lends itself to this nice little smoky character that you may be getting from the wine. And in terms of oak, uh, very, very neutral oak. So again, 10 to 12 months neutral French oak, and that's it. You know, the, we kegged it unfined and unfiltered, and what you're drinking is really kind of a true essence of Pinot Noir from Willamette Valley, and a very um, petite package, if you will. It's a very petite wine, and it's nice to have um, a wine that of this body uh, and of this level of kind of structure, just because it lends itself to, you could drink it every day. You know, it's a very simple wine in reality. It's not a wine that's gonna age very long, even though, two to three years would be fine, but the reality is it's a wine that you could drink now and be very happy with it. Okay, so let's first, let's look at it. Obviously the color is different than the Cabernet Franc. What is the color of Pinot Noir classically? Classic Pinot Noir is basically this color between cherry and garnet, kind of going towards garnet. So what that really means is that there is less kind of violet and purple and red hues in the wine, and there is a little bit more red brown hues in the wine and you can definitely see that in this wine it's not as vibrant as the the cab franc um, so classic color of, of, of pinot noir is really kind of this garnet this garnet color okay now again we talk about the extract or the depth or the concentration of that color this i would define this as really light going on medium much lighter than the cabernet franc is so let's give it a smell. We're gonna define aromas. Again, two fruits, two non-fruit. Let's keep it simple. Okay, so two fruits. For me, it would be like muddy raspberries, something earth, earthy raspberries, like you just harvested raspberries. They're in a kind of still got that soil and that kind of <coughs> earthy muddiness on them. And the other thing, and I know that Michelle and Carter are on here, is this kind of red purple flower. And, and this is your hibiscus wine. <laughs> so I hope you guys are laughing. We use the word hibiscus. Um, if you come to the lounge and you want to ask us about hibiscus and why that's funny, I'll tell you a story. But for the meantime, there is this kind of um, red purple flower component. And while that's technically not a fruit, um, 
it's sweet. It's not uh, an earthy flower. It's a little bit more of a sweet flower. Um, and then my two non-fruits would be this smoke component, uh, which kind of lends itself to something dark. And then I would say also a little bit of a kind of an evergreen, like, like, uh, like, um, I wouldn't say minty, I wouldn't say as aromatic as eucalyptus, but it's a little bit, um, what I imagine, like if you were to imagine going into the woods and, and, and kind of smelling pine needles and things in a cooler climate forest, a little bit forest floor like pine needles, evergreen, kind of that, not as, I wouldn't go as far as like a cleaning product like pine saw, but a little bit of that resinous piney character kind of comes through, at least for me. Evening primrose. <laughs> I've never smelt an evening primrose, but man, have I heard a lot about one. Another inside joke. See, when you're not here, like you gotta come to hear all these inside jokes. Okay, so those are my ar aromas. Let's uh, taste. Again, we're gonna taste for dryness, then we're gonna taste for acid, and then we'll taste for body and flavors. Okay, the wine is as dry as the Cabernet Franc. It's what you should expect. The wine should be dry. I don't know what a Rob's comment is. That a rock rock buyer? Rosh beer? What Rob is saying is that this Rosh beer is a is is when you smoke your barley before you make your beer, you get a little bit of a kind of a smoky character in the final product. It's like nuanced and subtle. Um, your your wine should be slightly chilled on your on your when you taste this. You know, I don't want you to drink a wine at room temperature or a wine that is slightly warm. You should be it should have a slight chill to it. You should feel that chill. Okay, the wine is dry. Let's taste for acid again. Now that we know what the Cabernet Franc from Chinon tastes like in terms of its acid, the question is, is it as acidic as the Cabernet Franc or is it less? I would say it's still relatively high, but it's not nearly like the Cabernet Franc. It's still got tart, cranberry, pomegranate, cherry, all those kind of red fruits that are verging on, on slightly underripe, still slightly green. There's a little bit of a bitter edge to it. Um, the acid is, is not pro as pronounced as the Cabernet Franc is. So I would say that in terms of acid, this is, I, I would define this as medium acid, where the Cabernet Franc was, at least from the Cabernet Franc from Chinon, was medium plus acid, okay? So right now what we have is a medium acid wine. Uh, if that is dry, let's taste for body. How heavy is it? Again, let's go back to the question. Is it fuller body than Chardonnay? And the answer is slightly yes. I mean, it's verging slightly to the right of Chardonnay, meaning I would drink my Chardonnay first, then I would drink the Pinot. In reality, if I had a Chardonnay here, Cabernet Franc, Chardonnay, and then Pinot in terms of your tasting order. Okay, so I have a, a medium plus body, medium full to a medium to medium full body, dry, medium plus acid. Uh, in terms of, again, fruits, uh, we can still put cherry there. Um, we can put things like cola there, like a cherry Coke or a cola. Um, you have all these kind of muddy, kind of earthy berries, raspberries, strawberries, uh, cranberries, uh, things that are still kind of in, and mixed with a little bit of alluvial character, a little bit of this evergreen component, piney component. Um, and it's, um, in terms of, again, body, it's slightly more bodied than the Chardonnay. Now, in terms of tannins, both of these wines are relatively soft. While you do feel a little bit of kind of bitterness on the wine, which I would define as tannin, it's not aggressive. It doesn't give you cat tongue. Your gums don't stick to your teeth. It's well integrated as well as the alcohol. The alcohol, while it can also be an astringent factor like a tannin, 
Um, it is also uh, well integrated and not abrasive. However, the, the alcohol on the Pinot Noir is definitely there. You notice it. It's not hot like medicine, like a, like a cherry cough drop, but it is definitely more ripe fruit in terms of character of fruit and the Cabernet Franc, and therefore you taste a little bit more of that, that alcohol. If the wines were out of balance, one of these points of structure is going to dominate, which means then the wine is atypical. Uh, in reality, we're, we're drinking two wines that are in harmony with their parts, meaning they are correct for what they're supposed to be. Nothing is pointing out in one direction or the other. And therefore, we say that the wines are balanced. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing. We're looking for wines with balance, whether that happened through blending or through the varietal composition or uh, through the vintage year. Those are all kind of things that, that we want. All right, any questions? Now that you have like two glasses of wine in you, let's really talk about the, the, the characteristics of these varietals. So the agenda is gonna go away. And we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about Cabernet Franc first. Just cause it's the easier of the two varietals to really, uh, to discuss. And let's do it this way. Let's, uh, I, I kind of put these in order. Let's talk about kind of the history of Cabernet Franc in terms of its lineage. I'll make this bigger. This is a super interesting graphic that I found. It's fun surfing the internet for free information. Okay, let me go here. There we go. Okay, so the idea here is what's the lineage of Cabernet Franc? Cabernet Franc is actually a parent varietal to both Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot, but it does it in two different ways and at two different times. Um, and what's interesting is that the mutations of Cabernet Franc or the, or the, the crossings of Cabernet Franc um, occur every time there's some period in history where there is a, uh, a cooling trend or a warming trend, particularly when we talk about Cabernet Sauvignon, it's when there's a cooling trend, and then when we get to Merlot, it's when there's a warming trend, and then it mutates and kind of does its own thing. So when we look at Cabernet Franc, <clears throat> um, in reality, we think Cabernet Franc is a varietal, let me back up, Cabernet Franc is, is indigenous really to the Pyrenees and the Southwest France part of France, and then the, kind of the, the northern, northeastern border of Spain on the Pyrenees, mountainside which lends itself to the Basque country and in the Basque country there is a grape called Honorable, um, uh, um, uh, Honorabi Beltza. Honorabi Beltza is a one of your classic varietals for uh, uh, Chacoli which is a very famous super light bodied slightly sparkling wine from the Basque country really great with like green olives and sardines and things of that nature. Um, uh, Don, when we do the Compostela, we're going to go through uh, the Basque country and then we'll have Onorabi's Belta and Chacoli while we're there. Assuming we're doing that, I hope we do it because it's going to be amazing. Um, so Cabernet Franc as a varietal is really indigenous to kind of the, the, the border between Spain and southwest France. And you can see that uh, ultimately what ends up happening is Cabernet Franc and some other varietal which is unknown, I'm kind of in this top kind of the right corner here, this unknown varietal, uh, basically creates uh, what is known as um, Onorabi Beltza, which is the grape that I was just talking about in Chocolate. So we know that Cabernet Franc originates from this part of the world. Uh, we just don't know exactly what its other crossing is, uh, at least at this time. And then <clears throat> as we get into France, we really have two other situations that occur. One is we create Cabernet Sauvignon by a crossing of Cabernet Franc um, and uh, Sauvignon Blanc. So Cabernet Franc, Sauvignon Blanc are the parents to Cabernet Sauvignon, which is uh, probably something you may have heard of at this point uh, as, you, as, as a wine consumer. And then where we get Carmenier from, Carmenier being uh, uh, equally full-bodied but well more herbal on its profile is a, a crossing of Cabernet Franc and Gros Cabernet. Gros Cabernet is not a disgusting Cabernet, it's just a larger berry Cabernet, a slight, a slight mutation that produces Carmenere. 
And that is why Carmenere is a classic uh, blending partner in the wines of Bordeaux. However, Carmenere eventually found its way to Chile, and that's where we see the best representations of Carmenere today. And then on the, the Merlot spectrum, you can see that the Merlot spectrum, which when we talk about Merlot, <coughs> we're talking about places that are slightly warmer, that have a lot more clay-based soils. And this is really talking about places like Saint-Emilion and saint emilion Grand cru and Pomerol and places like on the right bank of Bordeaux. And we see that Cabernet Franc uh, that crosses with Magdalene uh, of Charentes eventually produces Merlot. And when we think of Cabernet as a, as a varietal, it is, or excuse me, Cabernet Sauvignon as a varietal, it is a relatively new creation that really dates back to the early 18th century. It is not something that has been around for thousands of years like Pinot Noir has. Uh, Pinot Noir, while is prone to mutation, is, is a varietal that has been in existence for quite a long time, unlike what we see from Cabernet and, and really the Merlot family. So relatively new varietals that we can talk about. Okay, and then some leaves and clusters. Uh, just like Chardonnay, you can see that Cabernet Franc is, um, is prone to both situations that lend itself to um, mirondage, which is you have fuller berries kind of mixed with younger berries. And then this, this, is, a, this is actually a cluster that's from a picture taken from California. We're getting close to harvest. And the way that you can tell that is that your, your actual stem has started to um, turn brown and almost starchy, woody character. It started to, to, to turn into more of a um, uh, of hard material than anything else. And, and, and so you can see that with, even within the Cabernet Franc varietal, you have a mixing of different types of berries at various ripeness. And again, that's the, the reason why we tend to have really high acid Cabernet Francs. Um, there's not a uniform ripeness across the varietal. So certain characteristics in terms of Cabernet Franc um, is, let me pull it up. Um, Cabernet Franc is really a, a thin-skinned uh, a thin skin varietal, meaning it's, it's even more thin skin than, than Cabernet Sauvignon. It buds and ripens uh, at least a week earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon. And the other issues is that it's susceptible to downy and powdery mildew. And it's one of its benefits is that it's, it's resistance to cold, which is great for cool climate conditions. Uh, the question is, is can it hang on for, in warm climate conditions? And uh, the camera's shaking here, you guys, because it's windy. Hopefully it doesn't fall over. We'll find out here in a moment if it does. It's pretty well taped down, so I don't know. So we're gonna come, as we kind of go through these varietals, I'm gonna talk about the conditions of the wines in the vineyard and how that parlays into the wine styles. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about the, the, this, what I just mentioned here, thin-skinned varietals. Any thin-skinned varietal, on its own has very little or moderate tannin, which means that in the winery, we intervene. And we can intervene in several ways. One of those ways is by the inclusion of stems in the production. This, this idea of whole cluster production, whole cluster fermentation, is a very classic way to add stem tannin. The problem with stem tannin is that you start to get very green, kind of bitter character in the wine. And so you need a wine that has enough other structure for that wine to age so you get rid of that, that green bitter structure over time, okay? This becomes a very important part of production with Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir, um, as we'll find out, is one of these varietals that is really exclusively using, at least on a major percentage of styles of production, use whole cluster fermentation because Pinot Noir is even thinner skin than Cabernet Franc. So in reality, Pinot Noir is a varietal that has very little to no tannin in the wine unless you intervene. The second way of intervention is through oak aging. So I add oak to intervene. Um, the question as it pertains to these lighter bodied red wines is when you start to intervene with oak, you tend to very quickly dominate the flavor of the wine by oak. And so we have to be very careful when dealing with oak, particularly new oak, 
uh, with both Cabernet Franc and Pinot Noir, which is why these, you know, there's a lot of parallels why these grapes are very similar, uh, part of, of which is kind of how we deal with them in the winery and their kind of their, their, their character, their ability to be kind of overrun with production technique. Um, the other thing that's unique to Cabernet Franc, which lends itself to the entire Cab family, which includes Cabernet Sauvignon, Malbec, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Petit Verdot, is this pyrazinic character, that green bell pepper character, okay? While Cabernet Franc is early, early budding, it, it is also a situation that if you are in a cool climate, you need a very long growing season to, to, to basically cook. I don't, cook is not the right word, but mature that green bell pepper character. Okay, so the longer the growing season, the less pyrazinic character you're gonna have. While Cabernet Franc ripens one to two weeks earlier than Cab Sauve, still means a relatively long growing season. In a classical sense, we harvest Cabernet Sauvignon, you know, first, second week of October in France. Uh, in California, it could go to mid to late September. Um, if you're in a warm climate, all of that is expedited. And so the question is, is do you have a long enough growing season to develop your pyrazine character? So you, while it is a unique to the cab family, it's not becoming so vegetal that you don't want to drink it. And typically when you buy cheaper Cabernet Franc or cheaper Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, it's overrun by this bell pepper character. And it's just that the wine was either overcropped, harvested early, or, or, or uh, in a position where they did not intervene enough in the production to, to either blend or, or treat that pyrazinic character to the point where it's actually palatable. And unfortunately, those wines tend to be very off-putting and uh, unpleasant to drink. So on some level, it's quite pleasant. And we may like that character, particularly in a pairing content, con, con, uh, context. So in terms of pairing for the Cabernet Franc, you pair this with... Um, a cold pizza that has bell peppers on it, it's gonna be quite beautiful. You pair this with like, um, like stuffed bell peppers that has lamb and rice and a sauce on it, it's gonna be quite delicious. And so we have to use that character either as a pairing point or a blending point for us to create a, a better Y that has more complexity because that pyrazinic character. So really the issue with Cabernet Franc in the winery is dealing with pyrazines. Um, other than that, it's a wine that does not like a lot of oak because it's meant to be a lighter bodied wine. In the new world, as we'll talk about, it, it, it becomes degrees of ripeness. And so we have this underripe cherry character with the chinon that turns into uh, overripe character with a little bit more body, a little bit more alcohol. And while as a result of that, we can do more things to it in the winery, the reality is, is that it's never really meant to be an oaky wine. It's really about a wine that's supposed to be very cherry forward, um, that is medium, uh, light medium to medium bodied. It's never really meant to be a wine that is so full bodied that it, it's disguised as a Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? And then the last graphic here. <clears throat> is things that we've already talked about, but this is the Wine Folly version. Wine Folly has strawberry, raspberry, bell pepper, kind of this crushed gravel and chili pepper character, depending on where you are. The wine is dry. Uh, they, depending on where you are, they have listed it as medium body, medium to high tannin, medium high acid, and it's super, not really high in alcohol. So kind of the things that we've talked about, I don't necessarily agree so much with the high tannin. It just, like that Chinon that we had is super light in tannin. It's not very grippy at all. While it's noticeable tannin, it's not, it's not shocking tannin. It doesn't make your gum stick to your teeth. It doesn't give you cat tongue, as I call it. Um, you don't, you, while it makes you hungry, it doesn't really need, um, uh, doesn't need to be fuller bodied and more tannic than it is because that's what's correct for the style. I just read Craig's comment. <laughs> uh, that's nice. Craig, just stand in one place.
Yeah, super pretty wine. I love this wine. This is actually wine that we use in our level one certifications, at both producer and we do teach about the Loire Valley, but it's super correct. It's like exactly what Cabernet Franc should be, kind of dusty minerality, underripe red berried fruit, uh, this little bit of bell pepper character. Hopefully you enjoy it. It's a wine that makes you hungry, which I really love. I love wines that make me hungry because that means I have to eat and I love eating. Um, obviously that's part of my MO here. The last thing we want to talk about is the, the, the where Loire Valley, where Cabernet Franc really has made its home. So when we talk about the Loire Valley, you can see this is a slide taken from actually our level one certification course at the Guild. This is, you can see the outline of France uh, to the, in the right corner, and then you can see the the amplified Loire Valley. The Loire Valley is is the oldest growing area in France, uh, meaning it's a place that really dates back to really the middle uh, Middle Ages. And so, what we really mean, or the beginning of the Middle Ages, which is really a place that started making wine in 500, 400, 300 uh, A.D. and and so it is very old in terms of when you think of France, we think of castles and we think of uh, these kind of undulating hills with rivers through them. The Loire Valley is kind of this classic landscape of, of France. In the Loire Valley, there's the famous river, the Loire River, that is basically a 600 to 650 mile long river that basically uh, dumps into the Atlantic on the west and the closest town to the Atlantic is the Nantes. And so there's an estuary there very famous for super high acid, light bodied white wines out of a grape called Muscadet. Uh, Muscadet is also the name of the town. Uh, traditionally that grape was called Melon de Bourgogne. It used to be, uh, uh, the grape was called mel Melon in English or Melon um, from Bourgogne. Bourgogne meaning bur Burgundy. So it was originally a white grape from Burgundy. And so that's kind of the, the kind of the landscape. The, the river itself is, is basically goes across the river, creates a valley. And on this valley are more chateaux <coughs> than any other place in France. Um, the oldest chateau that's still in existence today in terms of production dates back to 1001 AD, uh, which is still making wines today. And so it is a, a, a very rich place in terms of food culture, wine culture, uh, archaeological culture, and is one of these places that has more UNESCO World Heritage Sites in it than really any other place on the planet in terms of a concentrated location of them. And so the Loire Valley historically is, is super famous uh, in terms of its uh, access to nobility because if you see on this map at the middle of the page, kind of at the top, there's the town of Orleans. Orleans is basically 90 to 100 miles uh, south of Paris, so it is a quick access to where the nobility live, and during the summer months, uh, it was actually a vacation spot for the nobility and people of the aristocracy and, and that had the means to actually travel and spend summers and other months outside of Paris. Paris being a very hot, swampy kind of town uh, doesn't lend itself to comfortable summers prior to the invention of the AC unit, really. Um, so you have this migration of people throughout the Loire Valley for centuries, which lends itself to a high level of sophistication of both wine production and food culture. And so the Loire Valley really, in terms of land size, is the largest growing area in France, but it isn't the most productive in terms of wine. Um, in the Loire Valley, there's, over, there's about 4,000 to 4,200 different producers, and it is the number one producing region in France for white wine. And when we talk about white wine in the Loire Valley, what we really mean is two grapes, uh, which is Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin Blanc. And while Muscadet or Melon de Bourgogne is a third white grape, it's kind of an outlier. It's really restricted to a single uh, growing area, which is the Nantes. Uh, but Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin Blanc are your two primary white grapes. And so it's a very important wine region for, for white wine. Uh, for sparkling wine, for rosé wine, for fortified wines, for dessert wines. It is really the only region on the planet that uh, produces every single style of wine, white, red, rosé, sparkling, sweet, fortified, dessert, all of the above, off-drive, 
that has a reputation for that style of wine outside of that country. And you can't necessarily say that for any other place on the planet. Uh, and what's unique about that is the, f the, the complexity of the food follows it. And so in the Loire Valley, the, 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 the food, the complexity of the food and the degree of culinary skill in that region kind of keeps pace or actually supersedes that of the wine. And that's a, something interesting to know about the region in terms of food and wine pairing is that it's very complex. There's always wines from the Loire Valley that you compare to really any type of food that you're thinking of. Okay, so since we're talking about Cabernet Franc, <clears throat> really what we, what we talk about in terms of Cabernet Franc in terms of growing areas is the Central Loire. And in the Central Loire, we have three main kind of districts. And we have what is known as Anjou. Anjou is very famous for uh, white wines primarily, but there is some red wines. Some more uh, very famous for sparkling wines. And then we have Touraine. And in Touraine, we will find Chinon, another village, uh, or commune that is known for Cabernet Franc. And so this is where Cabernet Franc comes from, uh, or particularly our Cabernet Franc that we're drinking, which is the Chinon. And then you can kind of see the rest of the region. We have a region called Sanceros, which is where Sancerre comes from, if you've had Sauvignon Blanc from, from there. And then right across the river from Sancerre is another very famous wine that you may have had called Puy Fume, which is what Robert Mondavi <laughs> Kind of tried to copy with Fumé Blanc, which is this idea of a California Sauvignon Blanc that's slightly oaked uh, to kind of give you this kind of smoky, high acid, mineral character of a wine. <clears throat> okay, a couple of other things to talk about um, before we kind of move on to Pinot, <coughs> which is really kind of names. Um, Every grape has many synonyms just because they are locally known for something. In the Loire Valley, uh, Cabernet Franc is known as, um, uh, I lost my thought, um, Breton, B-R-E-T-O-N, Breton or Breton. Um, and then we also have in the, in the Loire Valley, we have grapes like Malbec. Malbec is known as Coat, C-O-T. Uh, and so, as we kind of travel you know, th throughout the world, and we'll see even more so with Pinot Noir, we'll see the use of different names, but they are the same grape uh, just used locally uh, as, as a classic name that we know to of today. Okay, so as we kind of go to Pinot Noir, a lot more to really discuss. I, while we talked about Burgundy in the Chardonnay class, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Burgundy just because we kind of really discussed it. I, I will mention France, however, generally speaking, <clears throat> but I want to spend more time on, on the other growing areas and then specifically on the Willamette Valley because that's where our wine comes from. Yes, I'm, I'm answering, excuse me, a hiccup, so you should drink something. <laughs> um, Miriam is asking like Shiraz and Syrah, yeah, exactly. It's just different name for the different grape. It's a local, it's a local name. Okay, so for Pinot, we're going to kind of follow the same model that we did with Cabernet Franc. While I don't have a parentage kind of uh, outline of where Pinot comes from, I will talk about where Pinot does come from, but I don't have like the, that graph that I showed you with Cabernet Franc in terms of lineage. What I figured, because Pinot Noir is such a more important varietal around the world, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about it in terms of its growing areas. And you can kind of see the three main countries for producing Pinot Noir. Obviously, France is number one. U.S. is number two by, uh, uh, by a distance or so. And then Germany, Germany and U.S. are very close. And what's super interesting about Germany, which I, I will spend a few minutes on, it, <coughs> is Germany really started producing Pinot Noir in the last 20 years. It is not uh, a thing that has always been done there for a super long time. And it's really because of climate change that we see places like Baden and the Faltz region of Germany, where they're able to start to produce really famous and world-class styles of Pinot. However, very interesting in their youth that need quite a bit of time to actually mature into something that's uh, enjoyable. 
we'll talk about New Zealand. Uh, Switzerland is actually where uh, the, the parent, one of the parents to Pinot Noir exists, which is a grape called Sauvignon. And in, uh, in Switzerland, there is a, uh, the name for Pinot is called Sauvignon Noir. So they actually named the Pinot Noir after one of its parent grapes. It's still unknown as to uh, what the actual other parent of Pinot Noir is. <clears throat> and then we can see Australia. We'll talk about Australia. Really, when we talk about Australia Pinot Noir, we really talk about South Australia, Adelaide Hills, the Yarra Valley, so cooler climate Australia. And Italy, Italy, 3,300 hectares. Uh, all these are in hectares. So again, your conversion from hectare to acre is multiply that number by 2.47, and then you'll get your number in acres. Uh, Italy, very famous growing areas in Lombardy. Uh, Ultra Petro Pavese, which is in Lombardy, very famous for sparkling wines uh, in a style called Frenchia Corta. And in uh, Italy, they call Pinot Noir, Pinot Nero. And then we have Argentina, Chile, and Austria as kind of minor districts. Okay. So in terms of the vineyard applications of Pinot Noir, here's a leaf, here's a grape cluster. Pinot is actually the French word for pine cone. And so they named the grape Pinot um, after the shape of the cluster. And uh, I can't iterate enough the degree of mutation of Pinot. On a, so when we actually look at the DNA of Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Gris, uh, Pinot Blanc, um, all of those grapes are mutations of the original Pinot. They have, all have the same DNA. Uh, they just have a different mutation and then that lends themselves to a different uh, color and all, obviously a different wine entirely. But in reality, they are all the same DNA and they mutate. So even in Burgundy, because Pinot Gris is a, uh, a mutation of Pinot Noir and it occurs spontaneously, it may not happen every single year, Pinot Meunier and Pinot Blanc are the two exceptions in certain vineyards, or really all of the Cote d'Or, that if it mutates into that grape in that particular year, it is therefore then become a legal varietal to put in your blend. Otherwise, if it doesn't happen in your vineyard spontaneously, it is not a legal varietal, meaning you can't go out and, and procure Pinot Gris or Pinot Meunier to put in your wine in Burgundy. Only if it occurs spontaneously in your vineyard can it be a legal grape in that vintage year. So again, Pinot Noir is highly susceptible to mutation, uh, which makes it a very interesting varietal to study in terms of its clones. And uh, well, at the very end, if we have time, we'll spend some time on clones, but I'll, I'll mention some particular ones, particularly when we get to Germany. So <clears throat> cluster small, little kind of pine cones. Uh, leaf is super cute leaf. Like, I like this leaf. I don't know why, it just seems symmetrical. It's like a, a pretty lady. And then in the vineyard, and as a grape, <clears throat> Pinot Noir is thin skinned, it's early budding, it's early ripening, and then it's basically susceptible to every type of issue that you don't want. It's susceptible to fungal diseases like downy and powdery mildew, it's susceptible to leaf roll virus, it's susceptible to rot, and it, and it tends to mutate. <laughs> so the problem with Pinot Noir is that not only, oh, and the other thing is that it is a varietal that is very sensitive to its yield. You get very, very terrible wines when you overcrop Pinot Noir. Um, the fact that it has thin skins means you have light color, light flavor, light tannin, and then when you overcrop it, it basically becomes uh, uh, flavored water. And so you have to not only drop yields, which means that you get less production per acre or per hectare, but then it's prone to so many issues in the vineyard that make it one of these varietals that people are obsessed with because to get a great one, you basically spend your whole life searching for it. Um, and those of us that, uh, if you know of anybody or even yourself included, if you are a, a Burgundy hound, meaning you love wines of Burgundy and you seek them out and that's your favorite wine, you basically, it's a, it's a series of disappointments until you find a great one. And unfortunately, it's an expensive wine to play that game with. 
but Pinot Noir being a, a very finicky varietal, both in the vineyard, um, makes it a, a difficult wine to actually produce a, a, a high quality wine out of. And so when we talk about California Pinot, Oregon Pinot, French Pinot, Australian Pinot, they all take on a different characteristics, but all of them are very difficult in reality uh, to, to blend and so, <clears throat> or, or to make quality wines out of. And so in the last class, we talked about blending. And so in, P in the world of Pinot, we see a lot of blending of Pinot with Pinot, meaning Pinot from different locations, uh, so we can get the right structure, the right color, the right balance to produce a wine that's actually palatable and sellable. Okay. <clears throat> this is the wine folly description of Pinot. We kind of did our own. Slightly more body than, than Cabernet Franc, as you can tell. Still as dry as Cabernet Franc. Low in tannins as Cabernet Franc. Tends to have as high acid as Cabernet Franc. And tends to be as low alcohol as Cabernet Franc. So <clears throat> while this class originally called for Beaujolais, Beaujolais would be, or the great Gamay, would be the third parallel here. Meaning, in a blind tasting, if I gave you a Pinot Noir, a Cabernet Franc, and a Beaujolais, these wines are, those, those three wines are what we would call parallels, and very similar in terms of color, structure, characteristics on the, on the aroma and on the palate, and therefore become the wines that aren't necessarily the easiest to give away. While they all have their clues, like Pinot Noir is garnet color, and Cabernet Franc is cherry color, um, those are clues as to what direction you should go in. But if you're not a trained uh, taster or your palate's not trained, then those are things that you may think are the same and not really question and, and not get the correct answer in terms of a, of a tasting. But classic flavors, cherry, raspberry, mushroom, clove, and then the all famous hibiscus, as we've uh, not yet told that joke, but soon, I'm sure, if you come to Venovium. Um, so hibiscus, uh, a flower, clove, a spice, mushroom, earthy, umami, raspberry and cherry, kind of these earthbound red berried fruits, okay? It's not nearly as tart or as pungent in terms of its structure as the Cabernet Franc. It's softer as a result, uh, meaning it has slightly less tannin than the Cabernet Franc. And so when we talk about Pinot Noir, we really are talking about France. That's really the, the main thing that we should think of when we think of Pinot Noir classically. <coughs> and in France, we have really two primary growing areas. One is Burgundy, the home of Pinot Noir, which is classically done in a kind of a medium plus body, medium to high level of oak, high acid, kind of this dusty, earthy minerality. Um, these wines that, uh, depending on where they grow, can have different, a, a range of flavor intensity from very light, pretty, dainty styles to kind of brooding masculine styles. Uh, so Burgundy is the first region and the second region is Champagne. Uh, anytime you buy a wine that says Blanc de Noir on it, it's, it's literally, it's a Blanc, meaning a white wine of Noir, black grapes. So it's a white wine made from black grapes. Those black grapes are Pinot Noir most famously, and then Pinot Meunier, one of the clones or the mutations of Pinot Noir, okay? And so <clears throat> as a result, when you talk about the differences between Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, well, let me back up. Anytime you see Pinot Noir planted, you always have Chardonnay planted. They like the same environments, they like the same soils, and so it's not unusual that in Burgundy, it's also the home of Chardonnay and the home of Pinot Noir, and the same thing for Champagne. It's not unusual that we go by Blanc de Blancs, which are white wines made from white grapes, which is Chardonnay, and also Blanc de Noirs, white wines from black grapes, which is Pinot Meunier and, and Pinot Noir, okay? Um, it's very common to see these two grape varietals together, uh, and therefore, it kind of gives you an indication if, of what you can grow. In reality, if you can grow Chardonnay, you probably can grow Pinot Noir and vice versa. Okay, the other old world region for Pinot Noir, let me check my agenda here. We have Italy and the United, uh, Italy and Germany. <coughs> I did not pull up a map of I did not pull up a map of Italy 
Uh, it's minor in, in reality because it's not the, the most producing, although there's quite a bit of Pinot, Pinot, Pinot being planted in Germany, primarily in the Lombardy region, which is basically uh, just south of Milan, um, for mainly Frangia Corta. Frangia Corta, a sparkling wine done in a champagne method. Champagne method means Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Okay, and so we have, as a result of Pinot Noir being produced for sparkling wine, they're also producing Pinot Noir for still wines. And so you can get really great Pinot Noir from this region. Uh, let me preface, no Pinot Noir is cheap. So wherever you're going to buy Pinot Noir, it's always gonna be uh, more expensive than let's say uh, an equivalent quality wine of another grape from another region. That's just the nature of Pinot. Again, it's just the most difficult to grow uh, in a vineyard. And then I do want to spend some time on Germany because it's an interesting case. So before we kind of talk about this, I want to read you a quote by Robert Mondavi in 2002. In regards to German Pinot Noir. In 2002, Robert Mondavi said, German Pinot Noir is a grotesque, grotesque and ghastly wine that tastes akin to a defective, sweet, faded, diluted red burgundy from an incompetent producer. So what has changed since 2002? And really the answer is clonal selection. And this is a, a conversation that is going deeper into a, a rabbit hole, but it's an important one to understand how Burgundy has kind of come, or excuse me, Pinot Noir has become full circle, and why it is a grape that's planted in so many places on the planet, is because of its uh, ability to mutate readily, means that it is a varietal that can be cloned for certain characteristics that lend itself to better production in a growing place. <clears throat> okay, so I'm gonna mention briefly uh, uh, two very important clones of Pinot Noir. One is from Dijon, uh, which is the Cote de Nuit, the northern part of Burgundy, which in that part of the world, it was a clone created to ripen earlier, okay? And so when we look, if you go back, let me pull up the cluster of Pinot. When you look at the cluster of Pinot, it's a very small bunch, very tight bunch. Um, and so what the issue is, is that the and it's low tannin and thin skin so the the more the the bigger the berries the more juice compared to the grape skins which means you have even less tannin and the other thing is is that because it's so close together those berries is that you start to have issues with disease if you're in a situation or in an environment that it has higher disease pressure than let's say the northern part of burgundy uh, in, in and around Dijon, which is the Cote de Nuit, okay? So the Dijon clone was created specifically for a similar environment to the northern part of Burgundy to help ripen uh, a Pinot Noir cluster sooner. That's it, <clears throat> okay? The other primary clone, which is the clone that we're drinking in the Willamette Valley Pinot, is a clone called the Pomard clone. The Pomard clone is from the, the next district down in the Cote d'Or, which is the Cote de Bone. And in the Cote de Bone, there is a village called Pomard. And Pomard has a, a, a Pinot Noir clone there that has been copied uh, really primarily in the Willamette Valley. We also see that in New Zealand. But what the Pomard clone is, is basically the same um, as the Dijon clone, meaning it was used to ripen sooner but it was cloned to have smaller berries. So you get a little bit more intensity of fruit, you get higher tannin, you get a little bit more structure, okay? So that's two clones. I forget the name of the German clone, but what ends up happening in Germany is Germany is a warmer climate compared to Burgundy and compared to the Willamette Valley, at least particularly when we talk about our two primary growing regions here, which are basically region uh, five, six, and seven, which is known as the Baden, the Baden region, the purple region. <clears throat> and then the other primary growing region is the Faults. And the Faults is basically uh, number four here that borders that technically sits on 
the border of France. Okay, so those are your two, while there's other numbers listed here, those are your two primary growing regions for Pinot Noir, uh, also known as Spotburgunder in Germany. There you go, Don, right on. So synonym for Pinot Noir in Germany is Spotburgunder. Um, and so the, the conditions are slightly different. We have a warmer growing season, a little bit more rainfall, which means that we have a, a, a condition for riper fruit, um, but in a, a riper fruit condition in a, in a place that has a little bit more rainfall, it lends itself to disease pressure. And so what we end up having in Germany is a, is a different clone, a different clone that not only has small berries that allow for more fruit concentration, more tannin, but also now a berry that is not as tightly packed in as this berry on your screen or this cluster on your screen. So they have very loose berries along with thin berries to create a situation that can deal with a, a warmer, more human, more uh, disease pressure influence growing area. And therefore, as we see, Pinot Noir in Germany has totally shifted in time to something that isn't, as Robert Parker says, as a grotesque, ghastly wine that tastes akin to a defective, sweet, faded, diluted red burgundy from an incompetent producer. Whew, that was a mouthful. Okay, so let's talk about the problems with German Pinot Noir briefly, and then we'll head our way to Willamette Valley. <clears throat> Okay, so the problems with German Pinot Noir, let's start from the very top, Pinot Noir is expensive. So you have to go out and choose to buy a German Pinot Noir. It's like the up and coming region or a, a new region. You have to make that choice, whether you like German wines or you wanna support German wines, uh, that's your prerogative. But it's always gonna be an expensive wine. Uh, very rarely will you find a German Pinot Noir less than $28, $30, just because uh, they're not readily available and uh, the, the ones that you want are, are expensive. <clears throat> the, the, because of the clone that Germany is using, it's creating more fruitiness, higher tannin, fuller bodied wines. And so the result of that is, how do I deal with that in the winery? Uh, the way that you deal with that to kind of, to, to counterbalance that new structure that you created, both in terms of color and extract, body and tannin, is you match it with oak. And the problem with German Pinot Noirs is they use predominantly new French oak in a wine that is super ripe, uh, super full bodied, or I can't say super full bodied, but medium plus bodied, and also a very firm tannin as a result of the new clone that they're using. So when you go and buy a German Pinot Noir, it tastes like a, a purple bitter disaster in the, in the glass, mainly because it's a wine that you shouldn't be drinking for 20 years. And while they make great age-worthy wines that will eventually evolve into something more special than it is today, you have to choose to, to, to go out and buy a Pinot that is one, expensive, two, not from a known really place, and three, that you really can't drink for several, several years, if not several decades. And so while there's a reputation for German Pinot Noir, it is not by any means, um, uh, something that's spreading like wildfire that you have to go have because it's still somewhat unapproachable. The opposite of that is the New World wines. And so we'll spend some time segueing into the New World. <clears throat> and really this is just me talking until we get to the Willamette Valley. I'm gonna take a taste of wine. So when we talk about new world growing regions for Pinot Noir, what we really mean is the United States first and foremost. Well, I can't say first and foremost if we're not living in the United States, that's just my bias. We, we need to talk about New Zealand, we need to talk about Australia, and we really need to talk about Chile, okay? And I'm just gonna briefly run down the list of what makes each one of these slightly different, and then we'll come back to the Willamette Valley and spend some time there, and that's what we'll, we'll wrap up for the day. Okay, so let's start with New Zealand Pinot Noir. When we talk about New Zealand Pinot Noir, there's really three main growing areas. One is the Martinboro district. One is Marlboro, which is where uh, Sauvignon Blanc is very famous for, particularly Kim Crawford made that region super famous. Uh, and then the other one is the Central Otago. Okay, across those three regions, the style of Pinot Noir that we are producing that um, 
that is unique for New Zealand is really this idea of purity of fruit. It is a region that hyper focuses on fruit character and fruit ripeness without all the, the intervention of production. Okay, so it is a place that has a very full growing season, meaning April to October, you get super ripe fruit, meaning you get concentration of color, you get very deep and dark, almost like verging on red violet uh, or, or even violet Pinot Noir. You tend to get Pinot Noir that is properly medium full bodied, meaning it's more full bodied, excuse me, than the Pinot that we're drinking, not as full bodied as a Cabernet. So it kind of is in the middle of, of like a Merlot in terms of body, but dry like a Pinot should be. Um, and it's just a purity of fruit. That's really, until you really taste that, or if and when you go and buy a New Zealand Pinot Noir, you'll understand what purity of fruit means. It's all about the fruit. The, the oak that's there, if it is applied at all, is really meant to just carry the fruit forward and carry the finish. It's not really there for, um, as the star of a wine like you see in Burgundy or in, uh, definitely in Germany. Okay, in Australia, uh, um, when we talk about Australia Pinot Noir, Australia is going to be the one that most closely parallels California Pinot Noir. Uh, slightly riper, slightly warmer climate. You start to get things like a cherry compote or like the filling of a cherry pie. You get higher alcohol, a little bit more candied uh, fruit, uh, and therefore you get a little bit fuller bodied and higher alcohol. Okay, um, It's the one that most mimics itself as a California wine. California being slightly riper, slightly more full-bodied than the Australia. Again, when we talk about Australia, two main growing areas, primarily Adelaide Hills in the South Australia, and then also the Yarra Valley in the South Australia, which we talked about uh, on uh, Wednesday of last week with our red blends. Uh, the third category in Australia is really Tasmania, the island off the coast of Australia, a super cool climate that is producing under right styles of Pinot, very fresh, very light body, lighter bodied, more akin to the Pinot Noir that we're drinking uh, in the glass in terms of structure, but the fruit character is still more cherry uh, than it is kind of earthbound like our Pinot. Okay, and then the last category is Chile, and then we'll jump back up to California and Willamette Valley. And Chile, <clears throat> Chile, an extremely diverse region that you could really break up into three areas, the north, the central, and the south. And then within each one of those areas, you have what is known as the coastal growing area, the, the valley area, and then the, the foothills or the mountain areas. And so when we talk about cool climate growing areas in Chile, we really mean those that are in the central, the central area, but closest to the ocean. And so we all know that Santiago is the capital of Chile. So directly west of Santiago is a growing area called San Antonio, same name as the town just to south of us here in the hill country. So San Antonio is the, a super cool climate growing area, mainly for Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, things of that nature. And then the other one is called Casablanca. That's basically just southwest uh, that sits really just under San Antonio. Uh, that is also very more famous probably in terms of total export just because there's more volume there. That is also considered a coolish growing climate slightly warmer than San Antonio, but producing really incredible Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays and Sauvignon Blancs of really great value. If you haven't had a Chilean Pinot Noir, uh, definitely seek them out. Uh, it's probably the one place on the planet that actually still has value Pinot Noir just because of uh, not only the, the, the amount of plantings there, but also that the cost of production in terms of your workforce is way less. And also that the production in Chile, like many countries around the world, is subsidized. So there is some government assistance there to, to, to kind of lift the market. And then there is production in the south of Chile, namely uh, the, the other big city uh, in, Senti uh, in Chile is known as Concepcion, which is the biggest town south in Chile. Um, and Concepcion sits in a growing area called Bio Bio. And Bio Bio is producing Pinot Noir and then the region just south of Bio Bio named Itata. Again, we will probably have a Chile class because uh, I had the opportunity to travel Chile last year. It's one of these places that I came back questioning really everything that I not have been taught or learned, but 
was doing in the wine world. It's a place that has incredible diversity of plants and incredible history that deserves our attention and an incredible value. And so part of uh, one of our goals here at Vinovium um, has, has been trying to, over the last year to, to kind of consolidate a group of producers for import of Chilean wine. And hopefully that will start to come to fruition past COVID. Um, I know that the producers that we have initially selected are, are super excited. Um, we're just waiting to get past COVID so we can actually start to have meetings with buyers and suppliers and things of that nature. Um, and then the last thing, let's go back up and talk about California and the Willamette Valley specifically. When we talk about California Pinot, we really mean the southern portion of the north coast, which includes Sonoma, really Sonoma County and Sonoma. And then within Sonoma, there are growing areas like Carneros that overlaps with Napa Valley. We also have uh, places like Russian River Valley. Um, and it's, what's crazy is that unfortunately, those places in California have taken on the model that uh, more is more instead of less is more with Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a, is a super delicate, highly finesse varietal. And what you tend to see in the marketplace with Pinot Noir, and I'm gonna make a huge generalization because there's always exceptions. Um, what you tend to see in the marketplace for California Pinot Noir from Sonoma, Sonoma County, Russian River, and even Carneros is a tendency for alcohol levels to go above 14% alcohol by volume and the inclusion of new oak, which I feel like Pinot Noir, out of all the varietals that we taste, is one of these grapes that is really uh, the, all about the fruit. It's, I mean, the fruit is so pretty when you get it right, but then to kind of overshadow that by alcohol, over ripeness of fruit, oak aging, it totally diminishes the, the, the pretty factor that Pinot, Pinot Noir provides. And so, again, this is a generalization. California has been in and out of high acid, high body, low acid, high tannin wines, um, really because of the market appeal of, of wines that really kind of just slap you in the face. Uh, but there is a need for nuance with Pinot Noir. And in my opinion, I really feel like you start to see nuanced Pinot Noir as you move into the southern portion of the Central Valley, excuse me, of the, of, yeah, the Central Valley, which is places like Santa Barbara, and Santa Rita Hills, and the St. Inez Valley. Kind of cool climate regions that are producing wines that are more focused on the purity of fruit, um, more traditional in terms of a focus on Burgundian style winemaking, where oak is not the star, the, the ripeness of the fruit is not always the star, it's the, the cohabitation of all that structure that really is the, 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 the drinking uh, experience that they're really looking for. Um, so that being said, let's jump to Willamette Valley. We'll spend the last few minutes there. Yeah, as Rob said, Russian River Pinots, they, the, the, the higher the alcohol they become, they, they become spicy. Uh, and that's not necessarily what I'm looking for in a Pinot Noir, because then in the world of food and wine pairing, that completely changes your pairing points. Okay, so two growing areas. Here's Willamette Valley. So the picture on the left is the, is the Appalachian kind of at a bird's eye level. And then the picture on the right <clears throat> is showing you the six sub-districts of Pinot Noir. Or rather the six, the six nested AVAs of the Willamette Valley. And first and foremost, the Willamette Valley sits on the, the western half of Oregon. And it is technically a multi-state with Washington, which is not something that is commonly known, but it is a growing area that while has very little fruit coming from it, technically sits on both states. And so the Willamette Valley, while is a, an AVA, it is what is known as a multi-state AVA. And then within the AVA are six primary growing areas, and you can kind of see them there on the right. And really, as you go from north to south, the thing to think about is, it's as you get closer to California, you're getting warmer in climate. 
So the, the, the Pinot Noir that's being produced, let's say in Ribbon Ridge or uh, in, Sh in Shahala Mountains, those are super cool climate, a little bit more austere, more acid driven, lighter bodied, um, wines that may be a little bit more ageable based off of that structure and that acid profile versus the wines in Aloha Amity Hills, which is a super famous growing area. It's the region that I think most people uh, really like because the intensity of fruit, the, the ripeness of fruit, the, the bigness of the wine, the body of that wine is just super pleasing that it, it just lends itself to a, a really great drinking, a, a really great drinking experience at a younger age compared to the other regions further north of it. Yeah, so when we talk about uh, Willamette Valley Pinot, uh, this is the most Burgundian style Pinot compar comparatively to California. It's more earthbound, a little bit more savory. The fruit is, while it's still red fruit, it's kind of verging on that darker, muddier red fruit. Uh, there's a mineral, earthy mineral edge to the wines. The, the fruit is still the star. The oak is definitely in the background, but the wine is all about kind of the cohabitation of both fruit, place, and oak in production, whereas what you typically see in California is a, a focus towards fruit and production, not so much place. Um, and really the, this idea of fruit focus, while it means ripeness of fruit, it doesn't necessarily have to mean high alcohol and full body. Um, per, like when we talk about New Zealand, the reason why New Zealand is really famous for this purity of Pinot Noir is, <clears throat> is because while they have a, a, a decently uh, long growing season, they also have this unique temperature change, uh, a, an extreme diurnal temperature change between day and night. So not only do they have a long growing season, but they're able to maintain freshness from day and night time. So the resulting wine is very elegant, very well balanced, still high in acid, not as full bodied as a California Pinot, but the fruit is darker and completely ripe without being uh, overripe. Alrighty, friends. It's amazing how time goes by when you're drinking wines. Any questions before we kind of wrap up here? So again, uh, if you haven't gone to the YouTube channel yet, it's Vinovium Partners is the YouTube channel. Underneath the description of each of the classes is the link to all the PDFs and images I'm using. If you like the wines that you tasted today and in any other class except for the first class, um, I'm pretty sure these wines are still available. Uh, definitely the wines here at Vinovium are available. Just, just let me know uh, and then we'll make that happen whether you pick up or we need to ship. Really, we're kind of entering June or May going into June. By the time we get to the first week in May, it's probably going to be in the 90s consistently. So it's going to be very hard to ship wines. So if you need to pick up wines or if we need to deliver to you locally, call it, let's say, 50 miles radius around Johnson City, uh, we're very happy to deliver to you. All righty, friends. I really appreciate you. It doesn't seem like any questions are coming through. I hope you guys have a great rest of your quarantine Monday. We'll see you Wednesday where we'll be talking about the Piedmont or the Piemonte. And we're going to talk about my favorite grape, Nebbiolo, and a really awesome, I, I already drank in two bottles and I had to order more, um, of the, the Dolcetto. And the Dolcetto, I don't know, I feel like that's the wine that, uh, when you think of wine and just drinking wine, it's going to be that wine because it's so, it's the perfect wine on many levels, which we'll talk about. And so I'm super excited for Wednesday. It is our last class of this sixth class series, but again, we will continue just to figure out what that schedule is. And if you haven't heard what the governor said today about COVID and opening businesses, check that out. That's gonna have implications on us. And so we hope to see you guys super soon uh, here at the Growler Lounge in Johnson City at Vinovia. All right, guys, we'll see y'all soon. Take care. <laughs>